listening to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, your go-to resource for music marketing advice, music industry news, and discussion on the latest technologies in the digital music marketplace. And now, and now, and now, please welcome your host, Michael Brandbold from Michael Brandbold Marketing and Brian Thompson from Thorny Bleeder. Take it away, boys. Go! Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly. This is episode number 124. I'm Brian Thompson from Thorny Bleeder and the DIY Daily, and I've got Michael Brandvold with me this week. How are you? Good. How about yourself, Brian? Good, man. It's been a couple of weeks. I was going to say, it feels like it's been about a month. Well, I don't know when the last time we actually... It's probably been a couple weeks that we were off, and then before that you did the Uh, last show solo. I know, which was out of uh, 123 episodes. That was the first time that uh, either of us did something solo. Um, Because you were fishing in Canada. I was fishing in Canada, and I think I, well, before that, I wasn't I also, like, in San Diego on the baby moon. That's right, you were, yeah, the baby moon. Baby moon, so, but yeah, then Canada fishing, and then you just spent the last 10 days gallivanting, roughing it through the backwoods of Canada again, right? Well, I wouldn't really say I was roughing it. I actually uh, had a pretty fantastic bed and breakfast uh, okay. for, for a big chunk of it, so there was no roughing it. Um, anyway, you'll see another face on the screen if you're watching us on YouTube, and it's Panos Panay, the founder of Sonic Bits. How are you? I am good. How are you guys? Real good. good, Panos. Did I, I hope good. I, I uh, pronounced your name properly. Uh, you pronounced it pretty close to normal. Is that <laughs> <fine>? pretty- <laughs> <laughs> you, you like me you've probably heard your name pronounced many different ways and after a while you're just like if you're within 80 percent good job yeah. well it, it, it begs the argument if everybody mispronounces your name what is the real pronunciation of your name right. so. well that's there you go <laughs> whoa we're getting deep already oh man already it's like <laughs> minute two yeah so uh i'm not going to do an intro for you how about you tell everyone like who the hell are you and what do you do Okay. Well, I'm Panos Panay, and I'm the founder and CEO of Sonic Bids, which, believe it or not, today we're celebrating exactly 13 years since the day that I founded the company out of my apartment in Newton, Massachusetts. So you guys have the distinct honor wow. of, of hosting me on a very special anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah. 13 years. That's pretty phenomenal for yeah. any anybody, let alone an a, a internet-driven and computer. Let alone an internet-driven yeah. uh, music-oriented business. Right. Um, but uh, I, as I mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Sonic Bids. And for those uh, listeners who are not familiar with Sonic Bids, or a matchmaking site for bands and music promoters from around the world. We have well over half a million uh, members uh, from over 100 different countries that actively use Sonic Bits to book some 80, 90,000 gigs a year uh, through the site. So that's, that's our mission and that's our cause in life, to ultimately help artists connect with an audience in a meaningful way uh, by means of engaging with promoters on the other end of this great divide of ours. So Sonic Bids is all about the live show. It's not about selling, you know, it's not a, a store for selling music. It's not about T-shirts. It's not about hosting websites. It's all about connecting to book more gigs. It's all about gigs. They're not necessarily all live. So we have sure. a lot of music licensors. We have a lot of bloggers. Sometimes we're looking for a new music. We have airline companies looking for content for uh, their seatback entertainment channels. Um, we have uh, advertising company looking for music to license. Um, so it really, uh, you know, runs runs the gamut. Whereas I started the company initially. Uh, focus 100% on the live music, I would say over the last decade that's evolved to encompass anybody who's looking for music, no matter the medium. So so music placement is a big portion of it then? Uh, Yeah, and actually music uh, licensing has been maybe the fastest growing uh, part on on the Sonic Bits listing uh, network, uh, if you will. And especially as things such as uh, independent film and YouTube and the whole DIY movement has sort of 
overtaken just about every aspect of the media industry, demand for music has increased exponentially. We have app developers looking for music. We have toy manufacturers looking for music. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty unbelievable. We have music in, in coffee uh, that's beamed in coffee shops, that's beamed in Staples stores. Um, you know, most, most people are not quite conscious of the fact that the music they may be listening to in an elevator or the music that they may be listening to in, 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 a, in, a, um, you know, in a store, well, somebody chose that music. Right. There's an editor that sits behind some, uh, I guess, laptop nowadays, uh, selecting and choosing specifically to program that music. Uh, so there's been unprecedented demand, if you will, for for music, and I would say for quality music. And Sonic Bits is a platform that enables people to do that. I think you know most independent musicians out there must be somewhat familiar with Sonic Bids. I mean, you are one of the longest lasting. Um, music independent DIY driven sites out there. I mean, it's, uh, it's, you guys were kind of started right around the, the time of MySpace and, you know, they've kind of faded away and here you guys are, are excelling. What, uh, what, what's the secret to the success in you, in your longevity with the company and for it still being relevant and for it not fading away the way so many others have? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Actually, we started about five years before MySpace. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable to, um, you know, to some degree to observe all the changes that the industry has gone through. And I, people find it comical nowadays, but when they ask me what was the biggest challenge you faced when you were starting the company, you know, I, I liken it to um, if I were beginning to sell, you know, coffee, if you will. Uh, when I was starting out, I had to convince people that coffee was a drinkable beverage, <laughs> you know. So I, I, my, my analogy is sort of when I was starting out, I had to convince people that the Internet was a viable medium to use in order to actually listen and review music. I mean, right. a, a lot of my challenges early on was music promoters on the other end saying, unless a band has a CD, they're not real. They're not serious. You know, and a lot of my uh, uh, sort of education and salesmanship had to go and, 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 and was focused a lot more around why you should use the Internet as a viable means <laughs> right. of listening to music or as a viable means of connecting with promoters. Well, thankfully, 13 years later, I don't have to do that. Um, you know, I think I think the, the, the longevity for me is is due to a, a few things. Um, I, I would say starting out. I never raised a lot of money. I mean, I didn't raise venture capital money until seven years after I started the company. So that enabled that scrappy uh, sort of instincts of mine to kick in and maybe put in place, either wittingly or unwittingly, uh, a, a lot of um, you know systems where I never overspent. I was creative with my marketing. And frankly, I had to focus on day one on giving value to somebody who would choose to pay me money. I mean, from day one, we ha we're a subscription-driven service. So, you know, what that does, it's, it gets you to focus on, okay, how, how do I create value for a customer who is supposed to put money down in order to use my site? Uh, and you'll be amazed at the repercussions that that has that last for, you know, not one or two years, but again, for the last 13 years. Um, the, the, the second thing is I, I was, uh, at least at the time, and, you know, I, I, I sold Sonic Bits about nine months ago to um, uh, what is now called the Billboard Group uh, under the umbrella of Guggenheim Partners. But um, for all the last, you know, 13 years prior to selling the company, I was the controlling uh, shareholder of the business. And you would say, well, why does it matter? Well, for me, my vision was really, really critical. I wanted to stay true to that vision, and I didn't want to have uh, sort of that inevitable conflict that happens once you start raising money and you have a lot of stakeholders and shareholders. Sometimes companies, and you mentioned MySpace, they tend to lose their, their way. Um, you know, maybe the third component is that we always, and I always define what we did as a mission. So the people working here always explicitly understood that our mission is to help artists meaningfully connect with an audience that exists out there for them. It's just not always easy for them to find it. And maybe that audience was discovered through another stage performance at South by Southwest or another podcast that somebody heard, or maybe they were flying Virgin America and they found music 
uh, the emerging uh, music channel that exists on the airline and, and, and they discovered a new band or maybe they were on a cruise ship or in a college. But the people that have worked here over the last 13 years always explicitly understood why this company exists. Um, and, and to me, that promotes longevity or uh, loyalty among uh, the people who work in the company, which in itself sort of gets felt by, um, you know, the customers. I always believe that customers of anything uh, kind of in, understand the values of that organization, you know, the way that the product uh, works, the way that a customer experiences, uh, say, a customer service representative or um, every every piece of interaction you have with a company, whether it's online, whether it's a store, whether it's a restaurant, I think those values of the organization tend to permeate that whole thing. Uh, and the customer feels it. I think companies forget that. They, they don't understand that. You know, I've always likened a company to a jazz band. You know, at the end of the day, the person that sits in the audience doesn't give two dams that the trombonist is, is, is amazing at his solo. They just care is the end product that I'm consuming, if you will, does it make sense to me? Does it resonate, uh, mm -hmm. resonate with me? And it accompanies that way. I think, uh, I mean, what you're talking about is effective, powerful branding that resonates with an audience. And, you know, that's something that Michael and I talk a lot about when we're trying to help um, independent bands, you know, develop their fan bases, realizing your brand and realizing the implications of everything you say or do and how it it does resonate with people and how it can turn someone off or turn someone on. Um, and that's one thing I see with you guys is that you're, you have had a consistency in your brand right from day one. Um, you haven't like kept on rebranding your site and you know, it's you, you go to the Sonic bids and you know that you're on Sonic bids. I mean, it's, there's a, it's well, you, a, you, a, you also haven't changed your product fundamentally, mm -hmm. which, you know, that, 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 that trips up a lot of people, and especially when you're in an internet space. And for 13 years, we all know the music industry has changed dramatically in 13 years on the internet. And yet, you are fundamentally sort of, you know, other than the the growth of of the music placement services, your product is still fundamentally the same. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point. Um, I, I personally. It, you know, I never, it's easy to fall for the next shiny object. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and CEOs and founders and companies, they tend to do that, you know, because let's face it, it's, it's, it can be mundane and boring just doing the same thing. But it all depends on how you define what you do. You know, I mean, the company has grown enormously over, you know, the last decade, if you will. But the fundamental problem we solve which is helping a band connect with a promoter, is the same. That challenge has been the same since there has been, uh, you know, the first person who played music that was eager to find an audience. And, well, and, 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 I, and I think that's what's really important here is no matter how much the, the, the industry has changed in the last 13 years online, there's one constant that always sticks out. Bands still have to play live. No matter yeah. whether you're selling your music digitally or streaming it or whatever you're doing, you still have to get out there and play live, and that means you got to connect with a promoter. Well, I, what I would like to uh, touch on is, I mean, you've said that the, the problem of musicians connecting with promoters, does that problem still exist? And I'm wondering, is, um, is there other things that you guys are going to be going after in terms of providing solutions to, to the musician community? Yeah. Because I know, you know a lot of, you know, let's say, you know, I know so many bands that are connecting with promoters via Twitter. And you know, just like you said, you don't have to push the whole concept of connecting online anymore. People just do it naturally. So I'm wondering if, if, if things are shifting for Sonic Bids and, and where you might be going in the coming years. Yeah, you know, I think two things are happening. Um, the definition of what a promoter is has widened tremendously. So, you know, there's things that, I mean, I talked about a, a, a podcaster, right? I mean, there's, there's even roles that exist today that just did not exist when I started the company. Yeah. Um, we're finding things like, you know, house concerts growing. We're finding that consumer brands um, are coming into the fray and they're interested in creating programs that use 
music as a marketing means for their brand to meaningfully connect with an audience that's very hard to reach, you know, a young, transcending, uh, early adopting consumer. So on one end, um, I, I feel that whereas, yeah, maybe it's easy to connect with an easier to connect with a knitting factory today than it was 10 years ago, without a doubt, you have Google, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have all yeah. kinds of stuff. On the other hand, the definition and uh, uh, the scope of what a promoter is is changing. So part of what we do is saying, look, we have to evolve and evolve even our definition of uh, uh, who it sits on the other end, who this promoter is, as the marketplace is changing. And, you know, whereas I feel live music is a constant, there's also so many ways today to make money and connect with an audience um, that are vastly different than, you know, when I was starting the company, number one. Number two, whereas it's easy to connect with a promoter or easier, it's still not easy for the promoter to uh, make, you know, decipher signal from noise, you know, and part of what Sonic Bits does and part of what we're doing and part of what we'll continue to do is keep leveraging more and more, you know, let's call it data points about bands. You know, it used to be that the only data point that a promoter had was how does the band sound? And maybe I would call my buddy, you know, in the next town and say, hey, I saw you booked them last time. How are these guys? Nowadays, there's more and more information that can be uh, uh, assembled and disseminated to a promoter so that they can make a better decision. Likewise for the artists, you know, I, uh, you know, I feel that uh, it's not always easy to know, okay, how do I put one foot in front of another, you know, where I want to be, go from being a local band to a regional band to a national band to an international band. What's the best way for me to do that? Um, so, you know, very much like, um, you know, other connection services is not the connection that matters alone. It's also the information that makes the right connection happen, uh, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's, that's what we're focusing on. I mean, our, our, our product guys and our product releases over the coming uh, you know, months and, and, and year are gonna be focused around making that connection even more uh, meaningful and uh, more right, if you will, for, for both sides. I love what you had to say about, uh, you know, what is a promoter nowadays? Because, uh, you know, especially with, in the marketing world, every, every company in business is being inundated with the concept of content marketing. And that's how you market your business now is through content marketing. And, of course, music is the sexiest or one of the sexiest forms mm -hmm. of content. So are you seeing more... Um, a big name brands and companies looking to music to help uh, round out their branding and marketing and advertising campaigns? Oh my God, it's been a category that's grown exponentially for us. You know, I mean, even in the last few years, we've done deals with big brands like Gap, Diesel, Renaissance Hotels, uh, Red Bull. Uh, we just did a, a deal with, uh, with uh, Pepsi for... Um, uh, the Gulf Coast Country Festival. Um, so without, without a doubt, um, we have a deal with, uh, with the Marley family for a beverage drink that they have called Marley's Mellow Mood. Yeah. Um, so without a doubt, brands are looking not just to differentiate themselves, but they're realizing that music, and especially emerging music, attracts a particular kind of audience that they're desperately trying to reach. And to some degree, an audience that's become... Uh, less and less receptive to traditional advertising and marketing means. Um, and uh, just to maybe uh, paint a picture around this, the average band on Sonic Bits has about 5,800 social media followers that they talk to and engage with two to three times a day. So these brands know that if they somehow become part of that conversation, and ideally done in an authentic way, you're not in a, hey, go and buy Pepsi, but in more, hey, Pepsi is supporting me, I'm using an example, yeah. uh, to play this particular festival, help me, or and, you know, share my content, whatever it is. Um, then brand marketers know that they're tapping into, for me, a fairly sacred conversation and relationship that exists between artists and audience. And that relationship is changing dramatically. Um, so, you know, we've seen, and, and 
Uh, I may not be the first person to say this, but I, I, the Wall Street Journal reported that over a billion dollars was spent by marketing companies last year uh, to create and support these programs that are primarily geared towards young up and coming artists. Um, and it's ex that, 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 that spending is, ex is expected to grow to uh, well over three, three and a half billion dollars over the next three to four years. Uh, whereas we're seeing that label spending, especially in uh, developing young and new artists, is dropping for any number of reasons. Um, so these brands are playing, for me, a critical, you know, critical role, not just in the discovery and promoting of music, but in the, in the outright funding of music. And Absolutely. We're, seeing, we're seeing brands like Red Bull, um, uh, you know, taking sometimes fairly pioneering approaches. We've seen what a brand like that has done for extreme sports or for Formula One racing. Um, and for them to uh, see, for us to see them apply that onto the music side of things, I mean, imagine the change that, that can, can, can make. So aside from having like an amazing song, um, what is kind of the key to having yourself stand out for all these uh, big corporate people that actually have fistfuls of cash to hand over, potentially to artists? Have, have a devoted fan following, you know, and it's not just a sheer number as it is uh, the depth and the, and the uh, sort of relationship that, that you have with them, because ultimately that's what these brands um, you know, care about. They want and, access and, to a band's audience, essentially. It's, it's, I mean, think about it. Um, I, I often say that a band wants to connect with a promoter, and the currency that's exchanged between the two is the fan. That's all it is. A promoter it doesn't hire a band because they sound amazing. They hire a band at the end of the day because that band has, hopefully, the ability to attract an audience and that audience is a means to consuming something, buying a ticket, drinking a beer, attracting a sponsor, right? That generates a promoter's income. Likewise, a band, why do they care to connect with a promoter? Because they're interested in the audience that that promoter can amass for them. So there is this, you know, implicit currency that's being exchanged. And I think that it's important that artists understand that. A brand is the same way. For me, a brand is really no different than a Bonnaroo or a South by Southwest or anybody else. At the end of the day, they care about gaining access to that uh, artist following. And it's almost, to use a fancy term, it's permission-based marketing yeah. to some degree. Um, so that, that's ultimately what they're out for. That's why I define them in many ways as, as new promoters. Are there any um, kind of new fan-driven apps out there that uh, that you are kind of really seeing as, as something that bands are really benefiting from? I mean, uh, Michael and I, we, we talk about uh, these tools all the time. And, you know, for example, like Stage It or Jamplify, or we've had all these people on before. Are there any that are that maybe you've got your eye on? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of Stage It, uh, yeah. and I like, I like what they're doing. Uh, I'm a fan of bands in town. Um, you know, I feel that um, to, to this day, uh, discovery of music, maybe because of the, uh, you know, broad availability of it, uh, is, is difficult, you know, for the average person. I mean, I, I travel all the time. I go to a new town. The first thing that I want to do is check out the local music scene. But it was easy to find out what's happening. Um, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer of, of, uh, of apps like that. And, and of course, you know, things like RDO and, and Spotify and Pandora, I mean, it goes without saying that. I believe they are aiding the discovery of new music. Clearly, I think they can do more. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's also the economics of the whole thing that one needs to, needs to deal with. What's, what sort of um, tool sets or what's the process? So when a band signs up with Sonic Bids, how does it work? How, how do they get connected with a promoter? What do they have to do, and what do you do for them? Uh, you know, right now we're fairly hands-off, but that's changing. We're, we're launching a new platform over the next uh, two months uh, or so that will make that process a whole lot better, the whole matchmaking process. Um, but right now, an artist joins. Uh, the first thing they're asked to do is uh, to create their profile, which we've been calling their electronic press kit since first day that the company uh, the company started and then after that depending on who you are and how you set and define your preferences 
you get alerts for specific uh, gigs, if you will, that, that are of interest to you. Um, some of those gigs uh, charge money to apply, like South by Southwest or CMJ. But today, I would say close to 90% of all the gig listings on Sonic Bits are uh, cost nothing to, to apply to. Um, uh, but that's pretty much the way that the site works. On the other end, when the promoter uh, receives an application from an artist, they get their press kit, which is fairly easy for them to go through. But then they get a host of other information about the artist, like their you know, social ranking and other stuff that enables them to make better decisions. But part of what we're doing is realizing that, okay, we need to give better tools to artists to understand even when they're rejected, okay, what does this mean? So um, we are expected to use a lot of this information that we have about the, let's, let's use an example, a particular festival books 20 bands. Well, we know something about those 20 bands. At the same time, say they reject 120 bands. Well, we also know something about those other 120 bands that got rejected. We know their social ranking. We know their, uh, the, their what we call their gig velocity. The Let's say how quickly they've been able to get gigs since they joined the site. Their ratio of submission to gig booking. Well, we can help bands by saying, the bands that got selected, here's where they rank. And you, know, and you are over here. Here's five, six, seven tips of how you can get better. Uh, and it's something that I don't believe we've done as well over the last, you know, the last uh, few years. And it's something that we we're determined to do to do a lot, a lot better. And that's that's a fun part of of, um, you know, uh, having so many data points today that you can use both for the selection process for the uh, for the promoter but also for hopefully the tuition and guidance project process for the artist. When, when the promoter rejects a band, will they provide feedback to the band as to why? You know, some promoters, yes. Most promoters, no. You know, and we've tried all kinds of gimmicks to incentivize promoters to do that. And I mean, I will tell you, 13 years of gimmicks, because we always <laughs> know that that is important. And I'm, using, I'm calling them gimmicks, but everything from financial incentives right. to all kinds of stuff. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is important when you run a business. I mean, yeah, you know, there's only so much you can change somebody's workflow habits. If, you, if you're South by Southwest and you're getting 10,000 bands, to, you know, that right. are applying and you're selecting 1,800, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not easy to give meaningful feedback. And I think that's a key word. Is it easy for somebody to say, ah, yeah, whatever, you know, this song was not good. Sure. But really meaningful feedback that I can take and do something with it yeah. is, is, is very, very, uh, you know, very difficult. But I do, however, I do believe that things like, uh, you know, comparison information or, or tips based on what we know, because as a company, we know a lot of stuff about these artists. And, you know, we've also over the years have had an enormous number of artists who have gone on to greater prominence that have joined Sonic Bids and were members for five, six, seven years before they struck it, you know, bigger, if you will. Well, we know we know something about these people that distinguishes them from all the people who are not necessarily as successful. I don't think we've done as good of a job taking that information and saying, look, he here's how you can take this, you know, he here's how you can benefit from other people's success. Here's what they've done. I don't think it's a formula at the end of the day. I'm not going to pretend that there's some secret algorithm that's going to make, you know, me at five, you know, five ten, a fantastic basketball player. I will never be that. But, you know, there are, you know, if I wanted to be a soccer player because I'm more naturally inclined, I think that if I have that innate talent, it would be great for somebody to give me more meaningful feedback so that, uh, that we can improve. And that's what we're trying to do. Is is Sonic Bid set up in a way so if a band used the service and said, we want to do a West Coast tour from Seattle down to San Diego, and we'd love to do it between March and May, are you able to help place, put together a mini tour for them, reaching out to promoters? Right now, today... Not as well as we need to. I would say in six months, we'll be able to do that amazing, amazingly well, which is exactly what this new platform is all about. I would say that Sonic Bids right now is great when it comes to sort of uh, booking, you know, I don't want to say one-off gigs, but it works mostly in 
here's a posting, you know, a gig listing. I'm looking for bands in this time frame. Bands find that and they right. apply. But on the other hand, I don't think we do a great job when it comes to specific date based booking. You know, okay, show me all the clubs in Northern California that have openings on this particular date yeah. or this particular period. I mean, before starting Sony, because I was an agent for seven years, six and a half years, I, I know how booking works. And, you know, I just don't think that, again, we've done as good of a job, um, you know, uh, over the last few years uh, in that area. It's, it's funny, you know, you run businesses and sometimes you always, you know, you tend to focus on doing a better and better job at things that you're already really good at. And you tend to leave behind things you're not as, as good at. One of the nice things about the acquisition uh, has been, you know, the uh, ability for us to actually focus on replatforming the entire site and really adapt new technology, throw technology that's been around for 13 years out the window. I mean, yes, there's code on Sonic Bits that's been around for a very, very long time since I started the company out of my apartment. Um, but all that is done with what you were talking about in mind, sort of how do you make it a heck of a lot of, since we have this information, I mean, we have a lot of calendars, of, you know, of the artists, we have a lot of calendars of the promoters, this information exists, our data, it's in our database, but you know, just because it exists, it doesn't mean you're making it useful for people and that's what we're busy doing. So, so is that new platform going to go more towards what, um, the NACA agency does? Are you familiar with NACA? And, and we work with NACA very closely. So, so that whole model, because I spent years working that NACA circuit as well, where a band would come in and just say that, I want to tour the North Pacific Northwest this month, and the promoters all get together. They get a, a, a discounted rate because all these dates get filled up. And I've never seen that system outside of NACA, and I think yeah. that's... It's a gold mine. I think. It, it, it is, and I, I can't quite tell you... Uh, yes or no, but uh, I guess I'll say to you that we know the NACA model very well. We've worked okay. with them for years. I understand how block booking works. I think you can do miracles with block booking online. Um, and all I can say is, uh, you know, just be on the lookout. <laughs> well, I think uh, what we're hinting at here is something really exciting to watch in the coming months because it's still one of the top it's one of the top two questions I get from every independent artist is, how can I find an agent? And my answer is, well, you're probably not going to find one. They'll probably find you. So then the next yeah. question is, well, how do I book a tour? I'm like, well, you're going to have to uh, carve out a big chunk of time over the next months, and you're going to have to start uh, doing a lot of research and a lot of cold calling, a lot of emailing, and a lot of, uh, a a lot lot of, of patience. Yeah, a lot of submissions. And yeah. if there is a way, I mean, I know there's been other people who've tried to make uh, tour planning easier for independent artists, but essentially what they've always done is just like, well, here's the venues we know of, and here's their email addresses. And then three months later, those email addresses are out of date. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, there is definitely, when we started the conversation, we talked about Sonic Bids providing solutions to problems within the industry. And to me, that is still uh, a problem that needs solving for the independent artists to book a tour in a fraction of the time that it currently takes. With, without a doubt. And, and I think that's also, you, you hit on something that differentiates us. You know, the promoters that you know, use Sonic Bids, these are not email addresses, they, they were a platform. They have accounts on Sonic Bids when you apply you go into an inbox, if you will, you know, that, that, that they have. And, you know, it's easy to put up a shingle and say, um, you know, yeah, he, here's a directory of all the promoters. Okay, fine. But you need to have an engaged person on the other end. And I will tell you, it's not easy. That's what we have an entire team doing. We don't select anybody. It's not our job to select bands. But it is our job to ensure that the person on the other end is an active member of the community. Now, can they guarantee that they will book somebody? Not necessarily, you know, um, but by and large, you know, we are dedicated to making sure that every single promoter that is using Sonic Bits books at least one band for the period that they have their, their listing open. The other thing that I will tell you, I'm the first guy to, 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 to say that I don't think there's a silver bullet. I mean, I just don't. Right. You know, it's right. sort of like finding a job. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah, if you only use LinkedIn and you never use any other medium on the planet to find a job, 
Well, you're insane. I mean, you're completely insane. Maybe you'll get one, maybe you won't. You know, is LinkedIn a very effective way of presenting yourself and connecting with prospective employers? Absolutely. Are a lot of recruiters using LinkedIn to hire somebody? Absolutely. Is it maybe one of the best things out there? You bet. But you still need good old fashioned networking and maybe you'll do it on Facebook. You still need to go out there and talk to folks. You still need to have a boring paper resume. Um, you know, you still need to do the interviews and the phone calls and, and get in your car and drive somewhere. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I wish the world was simpler, but gigging is the same thing. You know, it's something that Sony Business is a great tool. It's maybe a big ass weapon in, in your holster. But if that's the only thing you go out there with you, you know, then y- y- you're you're going to be naked. You know, what are some it's of the other what are some of the other essential tools then outside of uh, being active and using Sonic Bids? Because I mean, let, let's face it when a, when a promoter, even if an artist is using Sonic Bids, they're probably not just going to look at the artist's profile page. They're yeah. probably going to go to Google. So, what do you think are some of the more um, aside from having an active Twitter and Facebook page? What are some of the more um, compelling things in an artist's arsenal to help seal that deal? I, I mean, you, you hit on two. I, I think, you know, so a promoter needs comfort. A promoter needs confidence. And for better or for worse, a good engaged social media following is an important element. Um, I would say to you that I believe a good old fashioned uh, professional website is important because that is your voice. That is how you present yourself to your your fans. And maybe nowadays people don't make as many CDs and all that stuff. So at the end of the day, I believe that, you know, we know this. A promoter uses Sonic Bids as a filtering system. They'll narrow it down. Um, but if, look, if, if you're Bonnaroo and you're going to book 10 bands from Sonic Bids and you're be, being hyper careful about the quality of your, uh, of your programming, well, sure as hell you're going to go and check a band's website. What do they look like? Sure as hell you're going to do a Google search. What's going on there? You know, you're going to go to their Twitter. Okay. What is their voice? Who are these guys? You know? Um, you're going to maybe check if their, if their music is available on Spotify, you know, or on iTunes. Um, you're going to go to their Facebook and see how they're engaging on that medium. And, and, you know, these, these multiple, I guess, sources of, of input say, okay, I'm willing to roll the dice and take a bet, which is ultimately what it is for, for a promoter at any, at any time. So, you know, Sonic Bits in many ways is the entry point. But it's not always necessarily where it stops, you know, and that's why we're busy developing a platform that can bring a lot of these other outside inputs for a promoter to make a good decision. So for me, if you're an artist, you know, just creating a profile on Sonic Bids and calling it a day, I, 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 you know, it's a good step. But it's the first step. You still have, you know, a few more. Absolutely. I mean, that's something we talk about a lot as well. I mean, it's I think it's an artist's responsibility to remove as much risk as possible from a potential opportunity so that a promoter or an agent or a, a music supervisor can say, no, 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 we, we have faith in these guys. I mean, look at everything that they're doing. Like, they're, they're going for it instead of, you know, landing on a, a website that hasn't been updated in eight months. That doesn't give much confidence. <laughs> yeah, because even if you're just licensing a song, Right. And where, where maybe that is the purest way of judging, you know, like uh, somebody who's licensing a song is primarily focused on the music. And like, like, let's say you're booking a band for a show where there's other factors in come into consideration. Even if you're doing that, you still want to know that you're going to be dealing with a professional person on the other end. Yeah. And very much like, you know, I mean, people can rail against, oh, my God, you know, why will shoot my website? Tell how professional I am. Why should I spend money on a website? Well, you know, it's the same as in the, the job market. Well, your resume, for better or for worse, tells somebody, yeah, this person is professional. It's not just what you write on it. It's the way that you present yourself. And a website or your Twitter following or whatever it is are ways that you present yourself. And people, you know, make determinations based on your professionalism. Nobody wants to deal with somebody who is going to, uh, you know, be a waste of their time, not show up 
or be very, very difficult to deal with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is, is, is Sonic Bid International? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have members from over 100 different countries. We have uh, over half a million bands who use the site. We have uh, about 36, 37,000 promoters uh, who are uh, registered with with the site. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I was born and raised overseas. Europe uh, has always been a, a focus of mine. Um, and about 30 odd percent of our revenue comes from outside the United States. What do you know what the breakdown is of your promoters as in how many are the big Bonnaroo's and South by Southwest versus the local bar? Um, I don't have an exact breakdown. I mean, I will tell you that, you know, by virtue of numbers, there's, there's only one South by Southwest and only one Bonnaroo, right? Right. Uh, I would say, you know, clearly we have a lot of, uh, you know, festivals and a lot of the opportunities we've been talking about uh, earlier in the conversation. But I believe we need to do a lot better with respect to the local venue market. Uh, we're not at the level that I'd like us to be. Um, and, you know, where a lot of the, I would say, meat and potatoes part of the market uh, is. Do we have local venues? Absolutely. We have a ton, you know. Um, but are, are we as deep into that market as we have to be? Um, I don't think so. You know, it's a, it's a constant uh, work and a constant sort of, um, uh, you know, determination for us to get to get better. We're not we're not there. If we were there, I wouldn't be talking to you guys right sure. here. I would be in the beach. <laughs> how about um, how about house concerts? You mentioned that earlier on. Yeah. You know, that's not uh, that's not something that you book through a promoter. You know, uh, it's it's somebody's house. Somebody is booking that to bring you mm -hmm. in, and it's a little different type of situation to to put house concerts together. Um, how do how do you handle that? Or is that something you know, you're working towards? It's it's a growing market. I'm not going to pretend to you that we're somehow the destination for house concerts. We've been keeping an, uh, our eye on it. Do we have people who post house concerts? Absolutely. Do we have people who post their weddings on Sonic Bits because they're looking for awesome emerging music rather than a <laughs> cheesy Whitney Houston cover band? Absolutely. Um, fundamentally, there's really no difference between... Uh, between, difference between somebody who's booking a muse, a, a band for a house concert, and somebody who's booking a band for, uh, for any other occasion. Um, you know, our job is to give them the right information so they can make the right decision. By virtue of the fact that it's a smaller venue, they'll get a you know a lesser number of uh, of applicants. But um, you know, for me, bands sometimes focus too much on the big sexy things and not enough on the smaller stuff that, frankly, they have a better opportunity and sometimes a more meaningful way to develop an audience. I mean, I will tell you, you know, if you get one of these house concerts and, you know, you play in front of 30 people and you have the chance to engage them and really sort of uh, turn them into fans, man, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's in invaluable. You know, it's, uh, again, I don't believe there's silver bullets. I don't yeah. think that there's this one booking that's going to somehow change everything forever does it happen to the odd band sure but that's the exception the rule for me is you know it's a lot of hard work and people yeah. just people don't want to send that message it's a it's a boring message to some people you know what you're just gonna to have to get up and do it every day every day every day and there's gonna be days where you don't really want to be doing it but you just have to do it and do it and do it and do it and it may take you three or four years nobody wants to hear that message everybody wants to hear oh my god i played this one gig and it just changed my life forever yeah I got i'll tell you as a guy I submitted once to Bonnaroo. They yeah. accepted me. Yeah. I played in front of 20,000 people, and I left that day with a record deal. That's uh, how it works. Absolutely. And yeah. Sonic Bits made it work for me. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. You know, ha have we had, you know, people get amazing gigs through the site? Absolutely. I've had bands tour China. I've had bands tour India. You know, I've had bands play in some of the world's awesomest stages. I've had bands, you know, fly with Sammy Hager at Cabo Wabo and record for a week. You know, these are experiences. But, mm. you know, a career is a, a, a sort of a mosaic of these experiences at the end of the day. It's not like one piece. It's many, many pieces put together. You know, and that's what we're hoping that we provide some of the brightest pieces for these guys and gals. But we're not going to be the again the only place, right? Uh, and I, I I don't think, as you said, obviously there, I don't think there ever can be. I mean, that's just not the way anything really works. There isn't like, one size like saying, fits all. That's like saying Facebook is the only place I'm going to connect with friends, or yeah. LinkedIn is the only place I'm going to get jobs. 
they're, they're awesome tools. Sonic Beats is an awesome tool. Uh, but for people who get disenchanted with the whole thing because they're not, you know, they somehow expect that just because they paid their $60, they're going to somehow just yeah. sit back and get a bunch of gigs. I mean, no, you, you're you going to get out of it what you kind of put into it. And it's Absolutely. like every tool on the planet, you know, I mean. Hey, to, uh, to, to kind of close off the call here. Yeah. What is perhaps the most creative use you've seen of your platform? Because this is always what, uh, what I find really inspiring is when somebody does something completely out of left field and it's like, wow, that, dude, that was unexpected. I know it's a spur of the moment. But. You know, I would say that I found that sometimes the most effective thing that people do is put a really cool um, iPhone-created video, if you will, on their, you know, on their Sonic Bits press kit. There is a lot of focus sometimes on making everything really shiny and really cool and really awesome, spending a lot of money. Yeah. And I found that by and large, something that captures the energy of your performance is maybe the, and even if it's gritty, even if it's like cheaply produced, even if it's just shot again with, with, a, with an iPhone or even a cheaper phone, sometimes that magic just comes across no matter what screen you're playing it you know, through. Um, so off the top of my head, and I'm sure in about five minutes after we hang up, I'm like, oh, I couldn't, <laughs> yeah, I can't believe I didn't bring up this example and that example. And I, you know, my PR team will be like, what the hell, you know? Yeah. Um, but to me, you know, it's sometimes there's so much focus on gimmickry, you know, that we, we kind of forget uh, what moves somebody on the other end. And it's that power that this music kind of, has to connect with us on such a visceral, you know, level. And today we have the technology to communicate that in a way that it wasn't easy even a few years ago. Um, so that, that's maybe my, the, the best answer that I, you know, yeah. that I have, you know, for that. No, and that's a good one. I mean, that seems to be a, a common theme throughout this call as well is authenticity. And it's really authenticity that, um, that connects it, you know, past the, the polished photos and the expensive music videos. Um, yeah. Capturing the true essence that, that's, uh, that what, a you know, seeing a crowd actually reacting, freaking out on a shaky, grainy iPhone video that uh, can that can make a big impact yeah and i think it's important that you know at the end of the day it's very important that for all the talk of you know marketing and social media prowess and you know and and, and again you know these different you know tricks and, and and gimmicks at the end of the day for me you know authenticity is the most important thing you know we start by talking about authenticity of intention of the company and I will say that the authenticity of the band is critical. You know, you can spend your time amassing Twitter followers and doing, you know, Kickstarter campaigns and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you only close the deal when your music, that one note, connects with a fan in such a way that it just pulls their heartstrings in such a way that they will never forget it. Absolutely. And that's when you know you close the deal. You don't close the deal just because a fan signed up on your Twitter. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you don't close the deal just starts. because of that's when the exactly. Starts. exactly. Yeah. And your job, your job is to keep selling that fan over and over. And when I say selling, you know, engaging that fan over and over and over again, not with like cute messages over Twitter, but with that connection that all of all three of us sitting and having this conversation, we can think of a moment, maybe when we were 12 or 13, when we heard this one song and it just blew our head up, you know? And, and, you know, you're a fan of that band forever. And when that song comes up, you feel that same feeling, no matter how many billion of times you heard that song. And sometimes we forget that, you know. And yeah. sometimes I think artists, especially artists today, who were raised in a very different era, kind of just, you know, forget that. Um, so that's my hopefully parting, uh, you know, parting words. Good stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. Where can uh, people find you online if they want to reach out to you? Well, um, they can go to my blog at panospanay.com. So it's P-A-N-O-S, last name P-A-N-A-Y, 
dot com, and they can uh, message me through there. The blog is a lot about entrepreneurship um, okay. rather than just hardcore music. They can always email me at panos at sonicbids dot com, or they can just go to the Sonic Bids website. Fantastic, Panos! Excellent. Thanks so much for thanks joining for us. Joining us, this was great. Thanks, guys. Talk right. to you soon. Take, Take care. care. Bye bye. Well, that was pretty awesome. Uh, we've been trying to get uh, Panos on uh, on this podcast for a while, so I'm glad we uh, we finally made it happen. Yeah, he's one great. of those that we rescheduled through nobody's real fault about two or three times. Yeah, and it's great. I mean, like we said at the top of the podcast, I mean, he's uh, the Sonic Bids is one of those companies that's been around right from the beginning of the whole internet DIY I had no idea music it was movement. Thirteen years. I didn't know it was before MySpace. Two thousand, they formed. I mean, that that's that's freaking amazing. I mean, they've yeah. seen the changes of you know Napster showing up, record labels still being king, to record labels dying, and well, I, you know, and I think like I mentioned, that's one of the reasons they're still here. Is they're in an area of the music industry that hasn't been destroyed by the internet. It's actually an area that can be helped by the internet. Abs touring, absolutely. Like, you know, the internet is not going to kill a live event. And to put it into perspective, I don't think iTunes even existed in 2000. I um, think they. I can't remember when it first started. It would have been maybe 2001, two, yeah, something yeah. like that. Anyway, um, so we've got a special track of the week for you, Michael. Who do we have? This week, we've got a band out of Chicago that maybe some of you have heard. Soil. Mm -hmm. These guys have been around for a while. Um, formed in 1997. And uh, this, their new album's called Hole. It was just released. W-H-O-L-E. Um, and it features the return of their original lead singer, Ryan, who, anybody who knows a little history of Soil, Ryan left them to go join Drowning Pool. And he has now since come back. This is sort of like their big comeback reunion album. Yeah. Um, the track we're going to play is called Shine On. The album uh, debuted in the Billboard Top 200, which is impressive. It's impressive for any band to be able to do that in this day and age. Totally. So, yeah, you know, uh, heavy metal, heavy metal. <laughs> I think it's something both you and I like. So hey, I'm a I'm a I'm a hard rocker, man. I'm a metalhead, so yeah. this this will just suit me fine. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> again, this is uh, this is from the album Hole by the band Soil, which is out on Pavement Entertainment. You can find it in all the normal places of iTunes and Amazon, and I think they did some special deals with Best Buy where they autographed like three thousand copies cool. through Best Buy, and Fye had guitar picks all you know you can and it's find probably them on rdo and spotify on and rdo and spotify you can find yeah. them everywhere yep cool well uh what's the track again the track is called shine on all right so this is soil with uh with the track of the week thanks you guys thanks everyone it was good to see you again yeah it is good to catch up <laughs> don't be away so long <laughs> see you guys take care
This podcast is brought to you by Music X-Ray, 21st Century A&R. Get deals, get fans, and get better. At Music X-Ray, it levels the playing field for musicians, giving you direct access not only to industry decision makers, but to fans too. Strike up a free account at musicxray.com and check it out for yourselves. And if you want your song to be included in podcasts like this, that's where you go to find these opportunities.